Welcome to the Delight Your Marriage podcast. You're joining me, Bevla Rose, as I dive deep into the beauty, power, and truths about intimacy. Learn not only the practicals, but the heart behind what making love is all about. Delight your marriage. Hi there and welcome. This is Bella Rose and I am so excited to chat. Oh my goodness. So today we're talking about resensitizing your pleasure. And this is actually for a lot of different individuals. You may think, oh, this must only be for a certain group of people, but let me clarify who it is for. It is for men suffering with erectile dysfunction, whether it's porn induced or, um, you know, just elder, whatever reason, um, now, there's lots of reasons for potential ED, but I will talk about that. Um, also, somebody who is in a sexless marriage. Um, also, for low-drive women, of which I would say that I am in that category naturally. Um, and then um, high-drive men, this is also for relevant for, and higher-drive women than their husbands. <laughs> So I, I think I might have encompassed the entire uh, human population. We'll see. But ultimately, um, at least those that are married, this is an important conversation um, really for all of us to recognize the goodness God has given us in the world. And um, there's just so much that uh, the 21st century culture, society, even Christian culture has put on us that I think is not actually biblical and not the way God wants us to live. So that's what we're going to get into. I'm so excited. As always, if you'd like to work with us, we've got an incredible team and process in place to help you get to maybe a stale marriage, to an incredibly passionate, loving marriage, or on the brink of divorce potentially, and you become the husband or wife that attracts your spouse to you without um, doing some of those repelling things that you've been doing, maybe your whole marriage. So really excited to help you. The way to get there is a free clarity call, totally free, but incredibly powerful. Delightyourmarriage.com slash CC to sign up as soon as you can, because our, our programs do fill up and we'd love to help you. Let's get started on today's topic. So what I want to talk about is how you receive pleasure just in your, in your life. Now, obviously delight your marriage. We talk a lot about marital intimacy and the pleasure God designed for that between a husband and a wife. There are literally thousands of nerve endings in the female genitalia that is explicitly purposed for pleasure. There is no other reason for it. And there are also thousands in the male genitalia as well, specifically for pleasure. And we have to remember there is one being that created us. So all of those incredible nerve endings that we as humans don't even understand, we can't recreate the human body. He, the God of the universe had a purpose for those nerve endings. He had a purpose for pleasure between a husband and a wife. But I actually want to zoom out and think about pleasure in a much more, a, mu a much bigger way. Um, and there's, uh, l let me just um, start with being very uh, embarrassing. <laughs> I like to always embarrass myself first. So, uh, so you feel nice and comfortable. You get comfortable because I'm, I'm going to start it off, start us off. Um, but I want you to think about where you find pleasure in all sorts of areas of life. And I'll tell you that, um, like, if you think about, let's say, the top three things in, in your area of life that has nothing to do with physical intimacy, whether you enjoy it now or don't, it doesn't, that's not the question. Um, but what, what in your life gives you pleasure? And so the first thing I would say, um, and this is a past season, this is, um, I would have said ice cream. <laughs> one-on-one -on -one coffee dates with friends, and um, horseback riding. Those are just such joys for me. Now, the problem with that list is my season has changed. Number one, I absolutely cannot eat ice cream anymore. Not only am I um, 
what's the word? I'm sensitive to dairy, but I also um, have decided to accept my sugar addiction and I just can't eat sugar like the rest of the human population. <laughs> so those two things. And if you've seen my first book, there are beautiful ice cream cones on the front because dag nabbit, that is such a gift to the world. <laughs> that I don't get to enjoy anymore. Um, but I believe in heaven. My renewed body is not going to have these issues and I will be able to eat my fill. <laughs> okay, moving on. That was me accepting that limit. Another one is horses are not allowed in New York City parks. In fact, um, I cannot, if you can believe this, create a horse pasture in my nearby park. It's actually not allowed. I know. I'm pretty uh, upset about that too. Um, <laughs> oh, just kidding. But the truth of the matter is I'm just um, not, uh, it, it's not feasible. We live in New York City. There's no way to own horses here. Um, and, and well, I, I guess I could pay a crazy sum of money and maybe, maybe there's like a paddock far away. Point is not reasonable, not the thing we're able to do. Cut it out. Um, and then coffee dates with friends. Honestly, since COVID, I've had friends that moved away. I've had friends that um, became really close during COVID and they live very far away. So even that pleasure of mine that I have loved going deep with girlfriends in a coffee shop is not something I can even do anymore. Um, and so I've decided there is no more pleasure for me. Period. I, uh, I just don't get to have pleasure in my life. <laughs> okay, you know that's not how I'm actually uh how I've actually decided, but that here here's what's happened. The seasons have changed. My priorities are different. I believe that God has called us to live exactly where we live in New York City. We are not meant to move to a place where I can receive pleasure by riding horses. Um on on a consistent like I would have liked to. I believe that God has given me a limit of Xing out sugar type foods, and that actually makes my mood more stable, and I'm able to actually do what God wants me to do in the world because I don't have the effects of sugar on my mind, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so many things that it affects. Um, but also, uh, I have owned, I've owned these limitations, and I have dear girlfriends that live far away that I can still have phone calls with on a consistent every week, for example. And, and I do, or every day we have little, um, apps that, uh, we have an app called Marco Polo and we send little videos back and forth every day. Um, just to, just to stay on our goals and accountability, blah, blah, blah. I mentioned that because, um, in case that's something that would serve you and, and help you to do God's will for you. And you just need accountability. That might be a, a system you and a girlfriend might want to implement. But, um, here's the thing. Why am I saying what brought me pleasure in a different season that I can no longer engage in now? Because I think it's important for you to consider what brings you pleasure that you are not able to engage in right now. So for the sake of the gentleman in a sexless marriage, his wife rejects it. He cannot engage in that pleasure right now. Maybe you need to go through masculinity reclaimed. Here's a plug so that your marriage changes so that you can receive that. But what happens in the meantime before that marriage has changed? Well, Jesus makes it extremely clear. It would be better for you to cut off your hand, pluck out your eye than to lust after someone who is not your wife. So that's insanely strict you may not be justified by gaining pleasure, sexual pleasure outside of your marriage because your wife rejects. That's not a justifiable solution. So how do you gain pleasure? All right, so let's put a pin in that for the, the man in the sexless marriage. What about the man with porn-induced um, erectile dysfunction? Listen, I hear you. I hear you. And that's, that's hard because maybe you've been free of porn for a long time and you're like, I still have this lingering difficulty, um, at, in actually enjoying the, the gift God has given me my own wife. And, and here's the thing. Um, I have to own my sugar addiction. 
It's a physical limitation. I cannot gain pleasure through sugar anymore. And it was an immediate pleasure and it was fun. And oh my gosh, I have an emotional issue. Immediately I'm going to (laughs) go get my fix with uh, my favorite type of ice cream. But no, that, that's not, that's not God's will for me. And, um, I'm, I'm saying it's similar to you, dear gentlemen, you know, that other aspect of your desire is not God's will for you. Um, whether your wife fits the, uh, what you have been attracted to in the pornography world or not, it is not God's, um, will. It is a sin to go in that direction. And so your best next step is to accept this, not fight against it, not struggle against God's will, but to accept it, embrace it, say, Lord, your law is perfect. I accept this limit. This shows me your will. Thank you for showing me your will. And that's what I I do. You know, I'm just giving you maybe silly examples, but I'm giving you real examples. Um, That's what I accept when I accept the the sugar limit that every single day I have to choose non-sugar foods every single day and low carb foods, because otherwise it, it processes the same way in my body. But you can do this because if God commands it, he gives grace for it. There is no law that he has commanded that is not, that is um, not possible for you. It is possible for you. Every single thing he says you must do, it's because he knows you can. It's just like a parent seeing their kid trying to walk or ride a bike maybe. And they keep crashing, keep falling. I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, you're sitting there like, yeah, you can. No, I know you can. I, I really know you can. Get, get back on there. You got it. No, you, you really can. You'll get it. Just, just don't give up. Just don't give up. That's what God's saying. You can do this. Just don't give up. But your first step is accepting this limit with gratitude. This is God's limit for you, and he knows better than you. He picked out your spouse for you. He made her body for you, and you can enjoy it. You can resensitize your pleasure to enjoy exactly who she is. And I also mean arousal. Your mind, your body are incredibly connected. And there's, it, it, your, your sexuality isn't in some box far away from everything else. No, it's all connected. But the first step is accepting God's limit, not allowing your mind to go in that direction, redirecting it every time, every time, every time, redirect, redirect, redirect. Um, and, uh, and recognizing that um, you can get there. Your arousal can match up. You can resensitize your pleasure. Um, and we're going to talk about that. It's, it's a process. Um, for the low desire wife, um, you, may have, you might be saying, I have never enjoyed sex. I, I've never wanted it. I'm not interested. Um, here's, here's what I would say. I, I've been there. I mean, there are so many aspects to sexual intimacy that have never been on my radar in terms of wanting it. And the thing that has been incredibly important for me is to integrate my sexuality with every other aspect of my life. What do I mean by that? It doesn't mean I'm thinking about sex all day long. It just means that sex is not off in a faraway box. Again, it is integrated. If I gain pleasure from smelling a beautiful rose, I can also gain pleasure from receiving um, wonderful caresses from my husband. It is me engaging with my senses in a way that's intentional. Not rushing past the rose, not uh, rushing past the caress so that we can just get it over with, please. No. It is me engaging with the senses, the pleasure God has given. So that's for the the low drove drive wife. And then for the higher drive spouses, whether you're a husband or a wife, higher than spouse than your, sorry, higher drive than your husband or wife. Here's what I want to say. There are so many ways to receive pleasure in this world. Sex is not the only way. Sex is not the only way. 
And so that's why this message is for you too, because I want to give you buckets and buckets of ways for you to receive pleasure that have nothing to do with sexual intimacy. So you are not pining away day in and day out. Oh, I just hope she is available. Or you, you come home nervous that she's um, mad at you for, for no reason, just to give her an excuse to not have sex that night. And you're like, I've just been so desperate for intimacy. And I just, I just want to give you so many other ways to receive pleasure your life. So you're not desperate for this one way to receive pleasure. So there's lots and lots of good in this resensitizing your pleasure that, uh, is coming in this, <laughs> in this episode. So that's a, <laughs> a solid introduction for each of you that is, uh, that is here listening. Um, here's what I think our society has conditioned men to think that sex is the only acceptable place to receive pleasure. Um, and honestly, Christians are, are part of that issue because when we say things like Jesus is all I need, um, and, and have only passion for Jesus, here's what often happens. And here's what I know that I did as a, as a young person is I cut off other interests. Um, I cut them off. I just thought, you know, Jesus is everything. And so I'm not going to be interested in hobbies. I'm not going to have other uh, things crowding my mind. I'm going to do the Bible and pray. And that's, that's it. I'm going to pretty much ignore most of other things in life. And the problem with that is, I would say, even in the midst of that season, I was struggling with pornography. Even in the midst of saying Jesus is all I need struggling with pornography. Okay. Then after getting married, um, to my first husband, uh, pornography wasn't an issue because sexual, uh, you know, things actually <laughs> sex became not interesting and actually a bad thing in my life because I was like, Oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. So, um, porn wasn't an issue. Then bulimia was an issue. And yet I was like, God, I love you with all. And yet bulimia committed, connected to this ice cream thing, um, was so, you know, it's embarrassing. I'll just throw myself in front of the bus for your benefit. <laughs> but, you know, eating ice cream and then purging it. Um, uh, that was an immediate escape from the difficult emotions. And um, it was like my only um, pressure release from my very, very intense life. Everything was intense. My intercessory prayers were intense. The way that I would, um, listen to pastors that were intense. I would read the Bible intensely. And I just was not interested in calming down. No, the rest of you guys are lukewarm. I'm not interested. But then I would have this dark secret by myself eating and purging. What? Or like I said, the season before that, uh, pornography, this dark secret. It was my only pressure release valve. Then I went away from God. Uh, if you know my story, the marriage ended in divorce. Very sad. Not what I recommend, not what I want for anyone else, which is why I do this work. Ended in divorce. I ended it again. That's why I need Jesus blood. That's not the right thing to do. Um, and I'm speaking in generalities, in my situation, if I had known what I know now, I could have changed the marriage. Hands down, I could have changed it. It could have been a happy marriage. But God in his infinite wisdom allowed me to suffer so that now I can help people like you. But that's the way my life was. Everything was intense. And the only pressure release was sin. Both seasons were both sinful responses to my not having an, an exit for the intensity of my life. I want to ask you if you have that issue. Do you have an intense life and then your only pressure release valve is something sinful? Whether it's too much television, whether it's on social media, uh, coveting others, whether it's an obsession with beauty, 
whether it's an obsession with having more, whether it's an obsession with going after um, even work stuff. You know, I don't know what it is for you, but I highly, highly recommend you take a good long look in the mirror and find out, are you going hard in life, going hard after God, and then you have a secret sin that's undermining it all? Why do I say it's undermining it all? Because Jesus says it is better for you to cut off your hand, for you to pluck out your eye, than your whole body is thrown into hell. That's a huge deal. I didn't say that. The God of the universe said that, and I'm not going to disagree with him. So here's the thing to keep in mind. Jesus, let's look at this. Think about a pie chart. All right. This is your whole life. Everything, everything you do, everything you think, all of it. This is it. This is you. <laughs> okay. Let's just say that your experience, all of it. All right. There is a small sliver of life that God says no to. It is a small sliver. We have the Ten Commandments. That's pretty clear. But then we have the New Testament um, that, that's also clear. Things like no, not quarreling, not murdering, not greed, don't lie. I mean, there are things that Jesus talks about specifically, that Paul talks about specifically, other James, other writers in the New Testament talk about instructions. Like we actually have ways that we are meant to live, things that we are not supposed to do. And I would say in this giant possibilities of life, let's call it that, this giant um, pie chart of life, possibilities, things you could do with your time, um, with your resources, your, all of it. I would say 18% of that is sin. 18% of that is do not do this. That means you have tons of options of things you can do that are good for you, that would be amazing for you to do. But you've got 18% you cannot do. And that's clear in the Bible. But there's so much in the world you could do. And here's what I think Christians do wrong, is they think they have a tiny sliver of life that they are permitted to do. I only can read my Bible and pray and talk about Jesus, and that's the only thing I'm permitted to do in this life. And I just don't think that's true. Because if it's true, when was the last time you watched a movie? Well, you weren't praying and reading your Bible and talking about Jesus. How dare you? How dare you? That was sin. Really? That was sin? I mean, it depends on the movie, right? But was it? Was it sin just necessarily flat out? What about horseback riding? Is that sin? Because I'm not uh, praying, reading my Bible, talking about Jesus. Is that just sin? What about sailing? Is that sin? No. No, it's not. We have a big, giant world that God created, and we can make it a worshipful experience by doing those things. And it's not sin by engaging in them. It's not. In fact, you can have all this wonderful passion for Jesus because you have positive ways of receiving pleasure that isn't in the 18% that we're not allowed to do. So I want you to think about your life in this giant part of chart. You have 82% of all of the choices in life available to you and just 18% that's not available. So if you stop focusing on that 18% and you start focusing on the 82% of life that you could enjoy, why then you're going to have all sorts of options for pleasure that no longer are going to be in the sin zone. So you don't have these, these massive issues with, with preachers that are going hard after God, but their only pressure release was sinful. But if they experience pleasure through the listening to birds chirp or going on a sailing adventure here and there 
or resting by by sleeping in the sun of their yard and their kids jumping up and wrestling with them on the on the the, the patio i don't know but that is pleasure don't assume god has three things in this whole wide world that he created for you to enjoy what what biblical what biblical grounding do I have for this? It took me a while to think it through, but here's what I have. Um, Jesus is our example, and he did things that were frivolous. Why, why do I know that? How do I know that? Well, he wrote in the dirt. <laughs> do you guys remember that? When, um, when the lady was going to be stoned, he was just sitting there by himself writing in the dirt. Jesus, what are you doing? I didn't see you contending in the spirit realm. Uh, what are you doing writing in the dirt? Well, we don't even know. We don't know what he was doing. I mean, maybe he was writing something really important. And maybe it was actually a sign that the lady saw and it was private. No, we don't know. He was just writing in the dirt. He might have been drawing for all we know. Okay. He chatted with those he met on the way. People were like, Jesus, come to my house. Da, da, da. He got interrupted. Then he got interrupted again. He decided Zacchaeus, he saw him on a tree. He was so important. He had all these things to do. And he said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house for dinner. Jesus, you don't have time for dinner. What, what are you doing? You don't have time for dinner. Like you literally have a crowd of hungry, needy, broken people that need your attention and you're going to go to this tax collector's house for dinner? Are you kidding me? And yet God's will was done through dinner. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> um, Jesus went to weddings. He was actually called a glutton and a drunkard by others, which means he must have been eating some fine food. Uh, he must have been um, eating plenty. Sorry, we just said that. He must have been drinking. He must have been drinking wine. Maybe he got drunk. Oh my gosh. I'm not a supporter of, of drinking and getting drunk, just so you know. I actually don't drink because it processes itself as sugar in my body. So just so you know, uh, and the New Testament is clear, we're not supposed to be drunkards, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, he definitely drank otherwise he would never have been called a drunkard. And he defended himself when he was called that. He said, well, the bridegroom is here. They will fast and mourn when I'm not here, but I'm here. Um, and we can't forget his very first miracle, the very first thing. If, if he was so intense wanted us to be so intense, there's no good that we get to enjoy in this world, then I would expect his first miracle to be, um, yeah, probably raising the dead. Yeah, and, and, and casting out demons and all this. But his first miracle was at a wedding to turn water into wine, and it was after the people had already drunk. My gosh, Jesus, they're already drunk. They already drank wine. Why give them more? That seems strange. Unless God's values did include pleasure in a healthy, good way, community, breaking bread. Why in the world would body and blood have to do with eating and consuming and giving thanks? Thanksgiving, joy, my gosh. Um, remember when uh, the storm came up and um, Jesus was sleeping on a cushion? What is he doing on a cushion? First of all, Jesus, I thought uh, the Son of Man had no place to, to lay his head, but now all of a sudden you're on a cushion? What? Maybe we don't understand Jesus' value system. Maybe he enjoyed pleasure in the world so that he could do the intense work, the spiritual work, the important work that was required. How about all the parables about feasts, the parables about weddings, the parables about the um, 
son returning to his his father and them having killing the fattened land and having a feast if jesus didn't want people to celebrate why would he give those examples over and over and over again what about the expensive perfume that should have been given to the poor says his disciples jesus said no mm -mm. no she just anointed me the pleasure of the smell we even talk, there's even Bible verses about the sweet aroma. Let our praise be sweet aroma to you, God. God enjoys pleasures, senses. Remember, what about, what's the difference between a hard heart and a tender heart? What does a tender heart look like? Think, think about it. What's the difference between a hard heart and a tender heart? Just put two people in your mind right now. One has a hard heart. Who is that person? What are they like? They're serious all the time. They're frustrated a lot. They expect really serious things about people. They're kind of mean, mean-spirited. A tender heart. They're gentle. They, they're kind. They're compassionate. They care. They're tender with others. They're, they they uh, notice. They are empathetic to somebody else's sufferings. What about the parable of the man that finds the sheep and rejoices? This tiny thing, finding a sheep. And yet Jesus is teaching us he rejoices in a tiny thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we get to rejoice. <laughs> in tiny things. Jesus cared about his listeners, whether it was 4,000, 5,000, those people who followed him and got hungry. He cared about them. He didn't say, well, listen, they're getting spiritual food. They better just deal. I went 40 days without food. They can deal with it. No, no. He used this as an opportunity to love them. He, he, he broke fishes and bread and, and made this incredible miracle. He cared about them. He talks about my yoke is easy and light. Like if he just wanted us to suffer, 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 no physical pleasure, no good things in our lives, why would he talk about a light yoke? That doesn't make any sense. What about do not worry? What about consider um, the, the flowers of the field? He says, they're they, you don't have to worry about clothing. The lilies of the field are beautiful, more beautiful than Solomon. Why would Jesus say flowers are beautiful if he didn't even notice them? I just invite you to think about life as opportunities over and over and over again to, to relish in the good of the Lord. Your pleasure does not have to be in this box of I either get sex the way I think I should get it in the ways and in the structure and all the things about sex. Either I'm going to enjoy pleasure that way or that's it. Like, those are my only options. I don't get pleasure. Okay, fine. Me, 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 me. I can't get pleasure. That's not how Jesus lived. Jesus enjoyed pleasure. He was so attractive. Even kids ran to him, wanted to be with him. Children, can you even imagine that? A rabbi attracting children? Oh my gosh. And women? abused women, women that were not allowed to listen to the teachers, to the rabbis. Are you kidding me? Women had their place. They were uneducated. They had something uh, they were required to do in these sorts of settings. And yet Mary had the gall to sit at his feet. Yet a prostitute had the gall to come to him and wipe her tears, his feet 
with his, her tears? What? This woman's abused all day, every day by men. And yet she thought in front of a group of men who have probably been the very ones to judge her, if not abuse her themselves, safely, she found safety to come before him and worship him and wipe her tears with, wipe his feet with her tears. He was not hard-hearted. When the woman was crying because her son died and he just was walking into town, he raised her son up from the dead. It wasn't because he had this massive call in his life. It was because he didn't want that woman to feel sad. He cared. He had a tender heart towards our feelings. And he felt and he wept. He had a tender heart. All of this is to say, you get to enjoy the incredible gift God has given. You know, I was reading yesterday um, the Bible part that says pray for your enemies. And he actually says, um, Matthew 6, 43, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Um, I think a lot of people, they focus right in on the perfect. Oh my gosh, I have to be perfect. Ah, That means intense and serious all the time. And, and let's be clear, what is perfect in this context? What is he even talking about? He's talking about how his, the Father in heaven gives his sunlight on both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. So perfect is kind. <laughs> perfect is kindness to the good and the evil. That's what perfection is. That's what he's talking about. So I'm not sure what in your head he means when he says be perfect but in this context we're talking about kindness okay number two what we're talking about is he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good my dear listener are you thanking God for today's sunlight because he gave it to you. This is a gift that you take for granted. You took it for granted today. You take it for granted tomorrow. You took it for granted yesterday. He gave you sunlight. And if he didn't give you sunlight, he gave you rain. This is a gift. And yes, the evil 
get to receive it too, but they are not thanking God for it. They're not properly responding to it. Dear listener, if you are a follower of the Most High, you get to respond properly to his gifts. He gives you pleasure in this world, but you are taking it for granted. Think about your prayer requests just for a second. A prayer request of a friend. Maybe you have somebody that's going into surgery soon, that kind of a prayer request. Maybe you have, um, I'm, I'm just throwing it out. Think about that. Maybe, maybe a friend of yours is struggling financially. Whatever it is, prayer requests. Now, how often do you thank God for the opposite? It's almost as though we um, think it's okay to ask for God for things, but we think it's bad to thank him for the things he's given. And I don't understand that. So many times I'm in Christian situations and more time is spent on prayer requests than on gratitudes and praises for what God is doing. For every one person that asks for prayer for health, every single other person should be saying, I just want to praise God that I literally have zero pain in my body right now. Zero. God has given me this gift today. And he gave me this gift yesterday. And he gave me this gift the day before. Oh my goodness. That should be our perspective of this life. And if you're saying, God, you give me pleasure the way I expect it to be given, otherwise I'm going to be unhappy. That's not an issue with God. That is an issue with you. So here's what I invite you to do. Dear listener, gain pleasure, gain gratefulness, gain thankfulness in every area of your life, aside from that 18% that's sin. (laughs) Don't do those things. And yet, you can go crazy on gaining pleasure in the good. In the good. Have Sabbath as a part of your life every single week. So you can just randomly rest on a daggone cushion in the midst of the storm because you know God is in control. And you don't have to worry Worrying is not going to add a single moment to your life. You get to trust God and you get to enjoy the journey and you get to go on a walk, even in the midst of a financial crisis in your home. I'm just making this up. And you get to enjoy the leaves and you get to look closely at the beautiful stems and and the bark, and the, the dirt, and you get to go closer and notice the peculiarities of the creation the Lord of the universe gave to you. He gave you the sunlight. Do not ignore his gifts. Do not ignore the pleasure he has given you. Otherwise, it's, it's as though you don't even know God. You're just ignoring his love. He is showing you over and over and over again. He is perfect because he loves his enemies. How does he love his enemies? He gives them sunlight. He gives them rain. He is loving you through rain and sunlight and you are ignoring it. He is loving you through his creation and you are ignoring it, taking it for granted and saying, you haven't given me pleasure the way that I think I should receive it, whether it's sexual or anything else. So dear husband, resensitize your pleasure. Notice aromas that fill you with pleasure. Walk into the kitchen and smell the goodness of that beautiful aroma and give praise to the Lord for that gift. You know how many people who have zero smell wish they could smell such a pleasure? Your eyes are on a sunset. Give thanks for that sunset. Give thanks for your eyes. So many people wish they could see the sunset. 
and the small things, your senses of touch. Yes, dear wife who has low drive, enjoy touch. Be grateful for the feelings of touch with your husband. Oh my goodness, holding hands, what a joy. An embrace of a hug, what a gift. And then yes, sexual touch, that is a gift for you, my dear wife. Appreciate that gift. The Song of Solomon's, I invite you to read it. That woman was in touch with senses. Senses, senses, senses. Dear husband, struggling with ED, porn-induced, get in touch with all your senses. All of your senses. Every single one. Resensitize every part of pleasure. And slowly, if you commit to this, that arousal aspect of pleasure will be restored. But you have to create intentionally over and over and over again reconnections to every sense, your sight, your, even your sound. There was a woman, um, my husband and I uh, have to take the train a couple times. We commute to a, a program nowadays. Um, anyway, we, uh, there's a, it's so cool. There's a lot of times there's subway um, musicians that, that come and they play these amazing instruments and it's free. You know, you just get to enjoy it. There is a woman, <laughs> I've seen her twice now. Her name is Joya Bravo. And I have walked past her um, playing her violin and it is mesmerizing. I mean, I, we, we had to walk past once and I was just like, son, can we just pause? I just need, so the second time that we saw her, I just, oh, it is phenomenal. I mean, it, it filled me with so much pleasure just sitting, observing her, the passion in her eyes. She shuts her eyes and she plays this incredible piece in the midst of the hustle and bustle of this subway where, where, 99.7% of the people just hustle by. And it's this magnificent piece that would fill them with such pleasure if they just chose to enjoy it. If they just chose to see and listen and experience. It's everywhere. You know what happened the other day? My, my son is... Um, well, both my sons, actually, this is a, a cool shout out of an app called Mealime, M-E-A-L-I-M-E. -E. It's insane. It's a meal planning app. It's free. And you, um, and uh, it, it gives you a grocery shopping list after you make your meal plan. And then it gives you really cool, like step-by-step -step how to make your recipes. So my husband has taken the initiative. I mean, this is literally my dream. Like God is so cool. But he's taken the initiative to um, grocery shop for each of these items get all the stuff, every single item that you need. Then every other week, weekday night, one of my sons cooks the meal with my, my husband. And my husband just guides him and just gets, you know, chopped everything, da, 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 da. And by the end of it, these boys are so proud of themselves. Last night we had lemon Dijon drumsticks with roasted mar um, mushrooms and artichoke and spinach salad. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a daggone tasty meal. And my 10-year-old made the whole thing just with basically cheerleader dad right there. It is insane. The amount of pride he has in himself and his work. But then also, he ate so much spinach last night. We have been fighting with these kids to eat their <laughs> vegetables. But when they make it themselves, they're like thrilled. Okay, that was the premise to this story. Um, my other son, who's... Uh, nine, so one is 10 and a half, the other is nine, um, was making a meal last night and they were, or the night before, and they were using purple cabbage. And my husband cut out the heart of the purple cabbage. And my son just took it in his hands and he said, oh, I never knew this was so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Kids marvel at God's creation. They marvel at God's creation. And you know, when my husband told me that story last night, I went and grabbed a head of the, um, the, the remainder of the cabbage. And I just took it in my hands and sat there with my husband. And we admired that cabbage head, the, like cut in half. We admired it for probably seven minutes. Just like, look at it. It's bright purple with a white, like 
lines all over the place and it's like wrinkled here and wrinkled there and it, it just looks magnificent. But I have rushed right by that cabbage every single time I've seen it my whole life. But seeing it through my son's eyes. And isn't it true that the Lord says, suffer not the children to come unto me. For only when you're like little children will you see the kingdom of God. It's either enter the kingdom of God or see the kingdom of God. But um, I'll invite you to to read your Bible and get that clarified. Um, Actually, let me just find it. Hey Siri, where does it say in the Bible that the children should come unto Jesus? So in Matthew 19, 14, it says, let the children come to me. Don't stop them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and bless them before he left. I just encourage you, children marvel at God's kingdom. Gain pleasure from the good gifts God has given you. Sex is not the only pleasure. Resensitize yourself to pleasure in all the things God has given. And remember, gentlemen, Jesus was the manliest of men and sex was not part of his life. You are not defined by your sex life. You are not a man because of what you do with your member. You're a man because God created you a man and he has pleasure for you, sexual and not. If it's not happening in your marriage, there is possibility for you. Even though you know, Bella Rose, delight your marriage, we are positive on intimacy. We want to help that. But I want to encourage all of us to resensitize ourselves to the pleasure of God so that that 18% of sin, we do not fall into it. We do not fall into it. And we enjoy the 82% left over that we get to enjoy. We get to relish in. We get to enjoy. Check out a cabbage. Go to your grocery store. Buy a purple cabbage. Cut it in half and spend seven minutes observing the pleasure the good gift your God in heaven has given you that you have ignored. Yes, that's your, that's, that's the next step is cabbage. (laughs) Let me pray for you. Father God, we love, we love, we love you. We love that every bit of our experience, we get to turn to you and say, God, you are good. The gift of sunlight today was your gift of love to me. And that is what it means to be perfect, like you are perfect, to give good gifts to the good and the evil, to love abundantly, extravagantly, to give even when it's not fair. Lord, I pray this one would be perfect as you are perfect in that they would treat their spouse that way regardless of the response they give, regardless of the response they love. Lord, that is how you show it to us. Let us not ignore it. Let us not ignore your good gifts to us. Lord, I pray that we would resensitize ourselves to your good gifts and your pleasure that you give us over and over and over again. We love you, Lord. 
We love that you are resensitizing our hearts to not be hard anymore, but to be tender, but to be influenced, but to be distracted in the way you want us to be, distracted by your beauty, distracted by the good gifts you give, not to be distracted by worry and hopelessness and all the nonsense you tell us in that 18% not to do. <laughs> God, give us grace to live this life in a way that is full and integrated and holy as you, Jesus, are holy, even though you slept on a cushion. <laughs> we love you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. All right, my dear listener, know that I love you. And uh, if you are going through hard in your marriage, it can change. There is so much hope. And we'd love to help you. Delightyourmarriage.com slash CC. That's your first step. Go ahead and do that. We would love to help you. God bless. Mm -hmm.